contrary to what was widely expected at the start of the present century, the world has not seen the end of major wars involving large conventional forces, much less the end of so-called small wars, confirming that Plato was right over 2,000 years ago when he wrote that only the dead have seen the end of war. Those lines come from a new book just published titled Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. And to encapsulate this book's significance, I will mention just two of its accolades. Henry Kissinger described it as an exceptional book written by two absolute masters of their profession. And General James Mattis, former Secretary of Defense, said it is a book that will shape the thinking of policymakers and military strategists for generations to come. And if you wanted to fuse the analysis and understanding of a widely recognized historian with the experience and insights of a four-star US Army general and former head of the CIA, then this might be the perfect combination. Therefore, General David Petraeus and Lord Andrew Roberts, welcome to the Money Maze podcast. Thank you very much, Simon. Good to be back, Simon. General, I know you've said I can call you David. Uh, our mutual friend, Simon Seabag Montefiore, described you as the ultimate scholar and soldier. And you're also partner and chair of the KKR's Global Institute. So it's great to have you back. We conducted an interview on Ukraine back in January and it was listened to in over 52 countries, including multiple downloads in China. Um, and Andrew, you are now Lord Roberts of Belgravia. You are an internationally best-selling historian and biographer whose books include The Storm of War, Napoleon the Great, which was winner of the Grand Prix of the Fondation Napoleon, and George III. You're currently visiting professor at the Department of War Studies at King's College and a visiting research fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. And I've been lucky enough to have dinner at your home a few years ago, and I recollect that in your amazing study crammed with historic items, there was a letter from Josephine to Napoleon, if I'm right. Yes, that's right. It's um, one of the uh, prizes of my collection. Fantastic. Well, as I would Red conflict. And for those watching on YouTube, I'm actually going to hold up. But it struck me that your analysis of the seven decades of conflicts following World War II, just how many of the variables discussed are highly relevant in running complex businesses today? Strategy and tactics, leadership, intelligence, research and analysis, disruption and new technologies, applying lessons learned and planning for the future. So there are almost too many questions to ask, but let the barrage begin. And we'll start with you, Andrew. What were your top priorities as you embarked on this book? I think one of the first things that um, David and I uh, agreed on was that we were going to try and put the Ukraine war into its proper historical context. Um, as soon as it broke out, we both recognised that um, it needed to be seen um, in its military as well as its uh, political and uh, geopolitical context. And that's really one of the things we wanted to do. Another thing we were very keen on doing was looking at the Ukraine war and seeing whether it had very many hints and signposts about uh, future war. And then also to have a chapter at the end on what future war would be like, which would cover things like cyber and sensors and space and robots and uh, AI, drones, that kind of thing. And we're going to come back to those towards the end because they have absolute relevance from all sorts of perspectives. I want to turn to you, David, because I want to turn opening part to strategy because it was von Clausewitz in his On War 1832 piece that, that I'll quote, the first, the supreme, the most far-reaching act of judgment that the statesman and commander have to make is to establish the kind of war on which they are embarking. Let's travel back to Vietnam, which is covered very thoroughly in the book, and, and, and I learned an enormous amount reading it. What was wrong in the strategic thinking? Well, successive leaders, first from France and then from the United States, failed to do what Clausewitz counseled needed to be done, which was to understand the nature of that particular war. Uh, the truth is that the French made a catastrophically bad decision to put their forces into Dien Bien Phu, thinking that that would be great. The North Vietnamese would gather there and they could clobber them, and it turned out that the opposite is what happened. And of course, they had to have a, an ignominious surrender and then withdrawal. The Americans came in and with the lessons of Korea foremost uh, in their minds, told the Vietnamese, well, you know, this is, don't worry about this small war that you're telling us that we should be worried about the, the insurgency in the villages. What you need is forces that look like ours that defeated uh, or at least got back to the 38th parallel in Korea. And so we helped them design a number of divisions uh, that looked remarkably like ours. 
including even in some of the equipment, even though the diminutive uh, Vietnamese in all cases couldn't necessarily shoulder it all. Uh, and so uh, we just failed to get the big ideas right, which is the first task of a strategic leader. And we had a su succession of strategic leaders uh, in the battlefield in Vietnam, uh, ultimately with General Westmoreland there for four years, uh, who really didn't quite get what the nature of this war was and tried to make it into what we, in a sense, wanted it to be, a big war, big units, uh, and so forth, against the North Vietnamese regular forces. And there were some of those, but the real war that was going on was the war in the villages and the hamlets, which was going terribly. Uh, and again, there were a number of other factors here. The partners that we had were far from perfect. Uh, there were a number of other challenges. Um, the nationalism that, of course, the North put forward had some appeal to those in the South, et cetera. But again, we did not get what was right uh, in terms of the big ideas uh, for far too long. By 1968, General Abrams came in, did really get it right. Uh, he did put forward the right big ideas. The problem was by then, domestic public opinion in the United States had eroded to the point where there was going to be a drawdown regardless of the situation on the battlefield. And we see this in a number of different cases throughout the, the chapters that we recount. Uh, and again, the biggest of the big takeaways for us, and we went back and really rewrote the beginning to emphasize this, was how important strategic leadership is. And as you notice, it's crucially important in business too, but you starting off there are four tasks, and the most important one is the first one. You have to get the big ideas right, then you have to communicate them effectively, then you have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas, then you have to determine how to refine them to do it again and again and again. But if you don't get the big ideas right, everything else is building on a shaky foundation, and it doesn't matter how compelling your leadership capabilities are, your example, your energy, your eloquence, uh, all the rest of this. If you don't get that strategy right up front, and then if you don't keep it right, uh, you are not going to succeed. And that's a common theme that comes throughout this. And we see where cases where this was done magnificently. Uh, Malaya is a great example. Uh, actually, Oman is an off-overlooked example where you had the Sultan of Oman over, goes to Sandhurst, overthrows his father, uh, then leads a brilliant counterinsurgency together with his British counterpart, one of whom was Brigadier General Brigadier uh, Sir John Akehurst, who later wrote a modestly titled book, We Won a War, um, and who I knew when he was the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and I was writing for the SAC year. You see it uh, with Maggie Thatcher and the military leaders in the Falklands. You see it with President George H.W. Bush uh, and the military leaders of the Gulf War, starting with his very first pronouncement, essentially, at the first meeting of his War Council, his National Security Council, uh, where he says, this will not stand uh, with respect to Saddam Hussein's invasion and occupation of Kuwait. That's a big idea. Military can take that. We understand what we need to do. And they go about and do it and, and did it very impressively as well there with General Powell and General Schwarzkopf. So thank you, because my next point to stay with strategy is to look at Iraq too and Afghanistan. And I guess, how do you each weigh up the ultimate outcomes versus the objectives? With both of them, really, it was difficult to define objectives um, right from the word go. And uh, and I think that um, policymakers were in a great, extremely difficult position uh, in the days after 9-11 to really to know exactly um, uh, who to hit when and, and where and under what circumstances. And uh, I think it's very important in history in general to uh, to try to put yourself in the shoes of the people who were making these decisions. Tremendously um, pressurised ones, needless to say. Not all of them were uh, correct. But nonetheless, um, it is tremendously easy, especially as an historian, obviously, to um, use 2020 hindsight in judging people who were under... Uh, you know, um, it had, had relatively little uh, intelligence knowledge of, of what exactly was going on. Let me build on that a little bit, if I could, because um, what you really have in both of these wars are, are several different f campaigns, if you will. And you have a brilliant campaign in Afghanistan to topple the Taliban and to displace the 
al-Qaeda sanctuary in which the 9-11 attacks were planned and the initial training was conducted. And of course, that it probably took some wrong lessons from that uh, it, with respect to Iraq, where we probably slimmed the force down too much based on the success in Afghanistan. The problem then was that we shifted focus very quickly from Afghanistan to Iraq and really never came back to it until after the success of the surge in Iraq enabled us to start shifting focus and resources back to Afghanistan. And the result was that it took us nine years in Afghanistan from late 2001, of course, when we went in and, and toppled the uh, regime, the Taliban regime with a handful of special forces on horseback, CIA officers with money and these surrogate forces, these warlord elements that forced the Taliban to mass and then we clobbered them with air power. Nine years to get the inputs right. And by that, I mean not just the big ideas, not just the strategy, but also the organizational architecture, which is not trivial, the level of resources, military, diplomats, spies, development workers, rule of law, etc. Uh, the right preparation of our forces, the right leaders, uh, all of this. And so we really wasted nine years uh, in, in effect uh, that could have been used so much more effectively. The level of violence in Afghanistan was much, much less than that in Iraq for many, many years because the Shal Taliban had been shattered, had to regroup in Pakistan. But ultimately, actually, Afghanistan, I predicted, in fact, in 2005, doing an assessment there for Secretary Rumsfeld as a three-star on the way home from Iraq, uh, would be the longest of the long wars. The, the challenges there were much more considerable than those in Iraq. And I provided a compare and contrast for him at that time. And that sadly proved relevant. At the end of the day, we did get the inputs right, but we kept them right only for about six months from about late 2010 into summer of 2011, and then began a drawdown, even if the conditions did not always warrant such a drawdown. And then we lacked the strategic patience at the end when there were alternatives. We could have kept 3,500 troops there, add some more drones. It was an unsatisfactory situation. But I would contend that it was far better than what has followed our withdrawal and the collapse of the, the Afghan government that we sought to support. And then with respect to Iraq, again, this very successful invasion and fight to Baghdad. I was a two-star general at that time. I remember it well as the commander of the 101st Airborne Division. But then we made some very bad decisions very early on, firing the Iraqi military without telling them their future, and then firing the Ba'ath Party without having an agreed reconciliation process. And this began the cleavage of society in Iraq between Sunni and Shia. Uh, and it really was not brought back together again until the surge in Iraq in 2007, 2008, when the big ideas, uh, and I was, of course, the commander of that, were literally 180 degrees different from what we'd been doing prior to that in 2006, let's say. So once again, the importance of big ideas uh, is just supreme, and you must get those right. And if you don't, uh, again, it doesn't matter how much you do all the other tasks uh, well, uh, you're not going to succeed generally. We see that um, a lot also in the big wars immediately after the Second World War. When the Second World War ended, everybody hoped that there would be uh, you know, peace for, uh, for generations. That clearly didn't happen. But in the two big wars, the uh, Chinese Civil War, in which some six million people died, and uh, then in the Korean War, which was also um, hugely expensive in terms of blood and treasure, um, you got uh, the, um, the people who got the big ideas wrong um, lost, and uh, and you see that again and again in in history, and it's one of the uh, in the really strong aspects of this uh, book is to uh, is to um, sort of drum that home really. What I liked as well, and I'm going to quote from the from the from the part on Afghanistan where you write by losing the conflict, allowing the country to become an extremist safe haven once again, and condemning some 40 million Afghans to a future of repression, deprivation, severely circumscribed opportunities, and very likely continued violence. So I think the candor came through, which I salute to you for. Now, if strategy is clear, leadership is absolutely behind it. You have explained that strategic imperative and the ability to inspire and lead and have stamina 
that obviously is paramount. I jump forward now to Ukraine. President Zelensky has been dubbed by either one of you or somebody, Winston Churchill, with an iPhone. And you say you say in response to uh, I think the moment at the beginning when he was given the opportunity to escape, his words were, "The fight is here. I need ammunition, not a ride." And you coined you said it coined a ringing battle cry of the 21st century. Andrew, how has leadership been essential in stiffening Ukrainian fortitude? Absolutely essential. It, uh, that moment when he said that he needed ammunition and not a ride was um, a uh, rallying cry, not just to Ukrainians, but to the rest of the world as well. Instead, um, of behaving like the uh, president of Afghanistan did, which was to um, get out as quickly as he possibly could, uh, taking as much money with him on his uh, private jet. Here was a man who was going to stay in his capital, fight to the end, stay with his his wife and children were going to stay there as well, uh, which showed absolutely Churchillian leadership. And um, we've seen the same thing, not just from him, in fact, but uh, David and I went to Kyiv um, three or four months ago, and he's been back there since meeting Zelensky. And all the people under Zelensky, the generals, the ministers that we met, were all equally um, uh, superb when it came to personal leadership. Andrew has some agency here because I, I don't think you mentioned what I believe is his greatest book ever, which is regarded as the best single volume biography of Churchill, uh, which was Churchill Walking with Destiny. In fact, we did a number of events together on that. Um, and so when Andrew says that Zelensky has been positively Churchillian, I think that's quite significant. And I think he has. Again, think of the big idea, the very first big idea. I don't want to ride. I want ammunition. I'm going to stay in Kiev. My family is going to stay in Kiev. All men in Ukraine are going to stay in the country. Um, and that sets the tone right away. But these are serious strategic big ideas because there was an expectation that he might have to withdraw to the western part of the country to Lviv. That was the ride that was offered and so forth. And instead, he chose to stay and fight. And that was not just a metaphor uh, for what took place. That was reality. And, and you saw then the people rally to this. And what's remarkable is, to be frank, his first two and a third years in office were saw modest achievements, but not the kind of, again, Churchillian leadership that he has demonstrated since then. And that's proven hugely valuable. By the way, contrast that with Putin's leadership. Putin clearly got the big ideas wrong. He totally overestimated his own forces capabilities. He completely underestimated the Ukrainian will to fight. He thought that he was going to make Russia great again. What he has done is make NATO great uh, again. Now, this is by no means over. He still does retain eight, 17, 18 percent of Ukrainian territory. It's a very tough fight in the south. It's evolving uh, in terms of the drone wars that are being pursued by each side. But I think it's a very interesting case, uh, again, a case study to compare the strategic leadership of two significant leaders, and also, by the way, by their military subordinates. And you've seen a revolving door in Russia in that regard, whereas General Zeluzhny, the commander in chief of Ukrainian forces, a very steadfast figure with a number of others, Sersky and others, who are the battlefield leaders. So if the strategy is understood, if the inspirational leadership is there, execution can be either assisted or undermined by the quality of the intelligence. Now, Lots of examples in your book, but I'd like to shine the spotlight onto two campaigns, the Yom Kippur War in 73 and the Falklands in 82, probably an un unlikely bedfellows. But you write, the Yom Kippur War was the most extensive investigation of a foreign war ever undertaken by US armed forces. And there are no fewer than 37 separate studies into various aspects, some of which still remain classified. Andrew, why were the Americans so eager to do such detailed analysis? Analysis. Well, because it's a uh, it's a war in which a surprise attack takes place um, right at the beginning, and um, of course it only came seven years after the Six Day War, in which the Israelis mounted the surprise attack. Uh, it's said by uh, Paul Wolfowitz that it's surprising that we're still surprised by surprises, oh. considering how many there are in uh, in history, and. Um, 
And so what you see in the Yom Kippur War is initial defeats by um, uh, by the uh, Arab governments against uh, Israel. And then the moment when Israel turns the war round and ends up winning a, a stunning victory. And it also seemed to highlight the moment when tanks were a... Um, uh, it had moved from being a great asset into being a, a, a dangerous liability because of the use of anti-tank weaponry. And so uh, one can understand why the Pentagon at the end of that war wanted to learn everything they possibly could about it. And they did. And they put it to what they had learned to great use um, only a few years later, 17 years later in the um, first Gulf War. And then in the Cold War, of course. And of course, this is a period of transition for the United States from the jungles of Vietnam, where we'd been for well over two, nearly two decades, actually, if you start in the mid-1950s, uh, to this major front in the Cold War between the standoff between NATO and the Warsaw Pact, which very significantly featured tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, artillery, and so forth. And so learning everything we could about the anti-tank guided missiles that were on this battlefield provided by the Soviet Union against the Israeli tanks which we could face on the inner German border was very, very important. And if we turn to the Falklands, you write the first naval war since the 1940s is to be studied so carefully by the US Navy. And um, you also write next to the quality of the personnel, the most important factor in the Falklands war was intelligence. And I wonder whether both of you could comment on how that intelligence gathering process is, is made and put to good effect? Because one thing, gathering, it's a bit like us in the investment business, we gather all this data. How do we actually push it through and make sense of it? Okay, it was David who was director of the CIA. I think he could probably <laughs> answer this one first before, before me. Well, to, to use very general terms, it's essentially the fusion of intelligence. You get various sources of intelligence, and now you have just an avalanche of data and, and so forth. And in fact, the unique aspect of the Ukraine war is that it's the most transparent in history. Everyone has a smartphone, access to the internet and, and social media and websites under which you can upload video and so forth. That did not exist, obviously, back then. But there were nonetheless all of the different means. There was imagery intelligence, there's signals intelligence, there's human intelligence. The trick is to fuse it, to bring it together. And this is what has advanced very dramatically uh, over the years uh, with a huge breakthrough actually in Iraq during the surge that I could describe. But in the case, again, of the Falklands and these other wars, if you put that together, if you understand it, if you get that right, you can conduct a campaign that has a, a reasonable chance of success. If you're surprised by it, on the other hand, as was the case in the Yom Kippur War, uh, obviously, the the early days could be very rocky indeed. It's really somewhat miraculous what the Israelis did do, ultimately, um, having been so surprised by the onset of this war launched by Egypt across the Sinai. And it was also, I think, uh, what I took from the readings, it was the notion of um, the power of a small state being able to overcome large rivals that both created concern, but also the urgency to understand, I guess, the vulnerability that the US was concerned about from an unexpected quarter? Well, again, it, I don't know that it's the size. I, I mean, certainly if you're small relative to your enemies, you better get intelligence right. It's the fusion that is so challenging these days. You have beyond mountains of data, you have continents of data from which you need to pull a digital needle. Uh, to identify if you're in the manhunt business or identify what's going to happen in certain respects. On the other hand, sometimes you have very plain facts, and but people don't always believe those facts. One of the other unique aspects of Ukraine was that the United States chose to release, to launder, if you will, highly classified intelligence into publicly releasable statements about the fact that Russia wasn't just massing all these forces on Ukraine's borders with Belarus and Russia, but that it was going to invade. And in fact, many individuals were in denial about that. You could argue that some in Ukraine were in denial about that because they really didn't do the full mobilization until about 24 hours before the actual invasion. So again, it's, it's one thing to have the intelligence. Uh, the data and so forth. It's another to be able to fuse it, to analyze it, and then to present it to decision makers. 
And it's yet another for decision makers, policymakers to actually make decisions on the basis of what it is that they've been provided. So you have this intelligence, you have the strategy, you have the leadership, but gauging morale is another thing altogether. And you refer to Max Hastings in his book on the Falklands War. He says the Argentinian problem was not tactics or logistics. It was morale on the ground. Among the troops on the mountains, it was worse than the British ever dared to imagine. But some of that brought about by the actions of the British. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, morale is a relative sport. And uh, there's two sides to morale. Uh, and the side that seems to have you know the 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 vigor, the the determination, the skill, uh, all of that uh, can bring about quite a plummeting situation of morale in in one's adversary. Yes, and we saw obviously with the Argentinians, um, they were very poorly led, um, they were poorly fed, they were badly equipped, they were freezing cold. Um, there was a culture, a vicious culture of hazing in um, in the Argentinian military. Um, and so, all in all, you know, things that could have been done to increase uh, morale. This is amongst their army. Actually, their uh, their air force had very high morale and extremely good um, fighter pilots and so on and bombers. But um, morale was uh, rock bottom even before the first shot had been fired in the Falklands. And so, um, yes, we do talk about morale a lot in this uh, book because it's a uh, we see again and again. Another, to go back to the Chinese Civil War, the morale of the Guomindang um, army was so much um, weaker than the, uh, than the Maoist uh, communists. And uh, even though they started that war with, um, uh, Chiang Kai-shek started that war with almost all of the cities and with a far larger army and with a lot of equipment, um, uh, they lost it. So I'm going to talk from morale to morality. You have a section on Algeria, which I think most people will be fascinated with, the War of Independence in 1962. As you say, in the course of the war, more than a quarter of a million Algerians died on both sides. And it was the widespread torture that convinced most French people that the cause was fundamentally flawed. You quote Teitgen as saying, all our so-called civilization is covered with a varnish. Scratch it, and underneath you find fear. The French are not torturers by nature, but when you see the throats of your comrades slit, then the varnish disappears. David, how do commanders keep to recognize standards in the face of onslaught? It's really quite straightforward. Again, you have to get the big ideas right. And the big idea in this world is adhere to the Geneva Convention. Uh, observe the laws of land warfare. For what it's worth, as a two-star general uh, in Iraq, we were up in northern Iraq, we actually were taking detainees. We couldn't send them higher. We, we didn't have the training or the personnel to actually hold detainees, so we had to do this all in a makeshift manner. And I sat down with my staff judge advocate and I said, what should our rules of engagement be here? Because there were words, you know, that we knew that there were enhanced interrogation techniques being used elsewhere and so forth. And we quickly decided, you know what, we've studied for decades of our military careers, the Geneva Convention and the laws of land warfare. It's required training every year. Why don't we just adhere to that? And we did, even though it wasn't officially a war, they weren't officially prisoners of war. Uh, a legalistic determination, really. The truth is not all did that. Uh, and some others succumbed to some very base instincts. And so we had Abu Ghraib, uh, which was a terrible tragedy, a stain, and it's indelible. This is ne These images are never going away. They're non-biodegradable and did tremendous damage to our image. I contend, um, when I took over the CIA, uh, I pledged to Congress that we certainly we would not ever again do enhanced interrogation techniques. I was against them at the time. I believed fundamentally that you can get someone to talk. Uh, they likely will not give you the absolute truth, even if you get them to talk again through some means like torture or what have you. Uh, it is very unlikely to be more valuable than the damage that is caused when this comes out, and it will come out. And so we uh, in the court of world opinion, enhanced interrogation techniques and black sites and so forth very much played against the United States. That's something that, again, is indelible. Uh, and the value that we got for that, I think, is very, very arguable. People have tried to make a case that this produced some kind of information that was helpful in the war of terror, war on terror. As a former CIA director, having looked at that, I 
I don't necessarily uh, agree with that. So again, the, the moral aspect here does matter. We see, by the way, Russia embracing a culture actually of war crimes, essentially. Andrew and I went to Bucha. We saw the images. We saw what took place there north of Kiev uh, and the terrible, again, torture, murder, rape, and so forth, and then trying to cover it up. Uh, it is almost as if the culture of Russian forces is to commit these actions rather than a culture of, again, adhering to the accepted norms of warfare captured in the Geneva Convention. I think that's absolutely right. And when you look at Algeria in particular, General Massou, who was the commander in chief of French forces in Algeria and also the governor, so he was the military and political commander at the same time, actually uh, overtly okayed the use of torture. And uh, so because this was uh, directly antithetical to what France, what the French Republic was all about in its foundation at the Declaration of the Rights of Man in 1789, it really went to the heart of the French domestic population about you know what kind of people they were. And if, if you can't um, feel good about uh, what kind of person you are, you're not going to win a war. Many things sort of sprung to my mind as I went through this book, and one was related, which was society's capacity for death and duty. And if I refer, actually, because I knew I'd had the book, and so I went and dug it out of my bookshelf, Max Hastings in Bomber Command, he says, as for those bomber crews, and I'm going to quote, it was deeply moving to sit through long evenings, listening to very ordinary middle-aged men describing quite extraordinary things they did as young air crew over Germany. I am grateful that my generation has been spared the need to discover whether they could match the impossible sacrifices that were made. Do authoritarian regimes have an advantage over democracies? In the first two um, days, they do, and then after that, they don't. <laughs> One of the reasons for that is because um, the decision-making process in uh, in democracies tends to be so much um, more rational and more um, uh, evidence-based, whereas in dictatorships, it's the whim of the of the person in charge. And again and again in history, you see um, democracies winning out as a result. You do see Putin uh, seemingly oblivious to the catastrophic losses that his forces have sustained. It's believed, for example, that Russian forces lost 25,000 soldiers, lost, not wounded, but killed in action just to take uh, the small village of Bakhmut during the winter offensive, the only objective they actually seized. This is 10,000 more, give or take, than they lost in 10 years in Afghanistan. And yet it seems to be sustainable for the time being. Of course, you never know. And, you know, this is one of these cases where the inconceivable, the toppling of Putin is inconceivable right up until it's not. And it looks back and you say it was inevitable. But there does seem to be a capacity uh, on the case of Russia to take horrific losses, uh, albeit he's doing it in a way that doesn't touch Moscow and the Moscow elite. Uh, in as much as it touches those in the more outlying areas of this of the Russian Federation, and to a certain extent, this is where we move to disinformation and cyber and this and the opacity you know that that is introduced now. Again, there's a very compelling paragraph in your book on February the twenty first, twenty two. You say President Zelensky was with the Polish president, who was on a visit to Kiev, and Zelensky said Russia would invade within hours, adding that the Russians think we won't fight back, but they are gravely mistaken. Andrzej, this might be the last time we see each other. Just help us understand what was going on at that point in Putin's mind. Well, again, Putin had overestimated the capacity and capabilities of his forces and totally underestimated the Ukrainian. And by the way, I would contend the American and Western response as well. Uh, if you think about the factors that may have led him to this, in addition to his grievance-filled, revanchist and revisionist view of history in Ukraine's uh, not having a right to exist, that it should rightly be part of the greater Russian Empire Federation. Uh, in addition to that, he could look at, at uh, Afghanistan and see that the Americans didn't have the strategic patience and determination to stay with that, even though we hadn't lost a soldier in 18 months until that tragic suicide bombing at the gate of the airfield during the withdrawal. He saw the way that was conducted. It was quite a chaotic affair, of course. 
Uh, he saw a red line years earlier in Syria that turned out not to be a red line, saw a tepid response to Crimea and the Donbass and so forth. And I think, again, completely misunderstood how President Biden, Prime Minister Johnson and others would respond. Uh, and that response has really been very, very impressive. You can argue that certain decisions should have been taken more quickly, and I would. But if you look at $44 billion of U.S. security assistance alone, and we believe now that you, European pledges actually may exceed that. People are doing the numbers, literally. Um, that is just staggering. I mean, the, 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 the U.S. contribution alone in the first 19 months is $10 billion more than the entire annual Italian defense budget, to give it some perspective. So he made all of these miscalculations and then also has just rotated, command, fired commanders one after another. The irony right now is that General Surovikin, for whom the defensive lines are named in southern Ukraine that have proven to be so formidable, so frankly impressive in terms of defensive fortifications, is not commanding the forces that are actually defending it. He was fired some months ago over some reason that, that Putin had. So um, again, comes back to strategic leadership again and again and again. And whether that strategic leader assesses the situation correctly, understands the context and the various factors at play, and ultimately decides on the right big ideas. And also, of course, as David um, alluded to, he gave us, Putin gave us an extraordinary insight into his thinking in this 6,500 word essay that he published in the uh, August before the invasion on the historical unity of the Ukraine and Russia, uh, which was the uh, the title of this sort of rambling, historically very badly um, researched, frankly, uh, essay. He wouldn't have got an A plus for, uh, for as a not, not from Professor Robert. <laughs> <laughs> or Professor Petraeus, for and, that matter. Uh, and, but in the course of that, and when I was reading it, I was adding it up. Um, in the course of it, he mentions Lithuania no fewer than 17 times. And so, you know, the West has to win in Ukraine because if not, it's clear from his own um, writings that Lithuania is next. So you also quote General Gerasimov, and I'm not sure I understood it, which is why I'd like some colour on this, which is the role of non-military means of achieving political and strategic goals has grown and in many cases have exceeded the power of conventional weapons. Yes, this is the um, now famous uh, Gerasimov doctrine, which didn't actually last terribly long, did it? No, no, no. It's had a short half-life. <laughs> We're now going to move into this, um, the other forms of warfare and the changing nature of warfare. You quote Peter Singer who said, wars are testing grounds or laboratories. Um, and you've also illustrated everything from the virus that was sent into Iran from Israel to infect their con con the computers through to um, what Neil Ferguson has described as a 20th century invasion being checked by a 21st century defense. Give us a sense of some of these technological revolutions that are in play right now? Well, first of all, we should recognize that Ukraine is both a throwback to earlier wars and has glimpses of the future of war, which is the essence of your question. But let's not forget that this is also World War I. Look at the defensive positions, the depths of the minefields, the tank ditches, the, the, the concertina wire, the trenches full of soldiers, uh, dragon's teeth, all of this. Uh, but you also have the Cold War, Many of the vehicles, the, the weapon systems, the tanks, the infantry fighting vehicles, the artillery are essentially what we were planning to use had we had to defend Western Europe against the Russian systems that are actually being used uh, here as well back in the late 1980s when, again, I was a major in a brigade on the inner German border. But then you do have these advances. You see increasing use of unmanned systems and not just in the air but also on the surface of the sea, perhaps some below the surface of the sea. And increasingly, they're not just remotely piloted, they are piloted by algorithms, if you will, uh, and so forth, where the human in the loop is the person that actually designs the program that the, the computer in this unmanned system executes. And that is likely the future of war. I think that war over time because of the ability to see everything. In fact, let me 
back in the Cold War, there was an adage that said, what can be seen can be hit, what can be hit can be killed. The truth is we couldn't see all that much. We couldn't hit it all that well, especially if it was moving. Um, and therefore, you couldn't kill it all that well. So it was mostly you're going to be the fight at the front lines. We tried to extend the depth of the battlefield. That was the essence of airland battle, but with the you know modest ability to do so. We can now very much operationalize that adage. If you think of an Indo-Pacific theater, we can see everything. The intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance capabilities are extraordinary. There are networks that communicate that information throughout the, the command and control system. You can tie them very quickly to the shooters, and you have dynamic targeting and so forth. Uh, and some of the systems will be at hypersonic speed with maneuver during the final descent, et cetera. So again, you can very much see everything, you can hit it, you can kill it. So we have to transition, really transform our forces from a very small number of very large platforms that are incredibly capable, heavily manned, incredibly expensive, to a much larger number, vastly larger number of much smaller systems, most of which will be unmanned, uh, and many of which will not just be remotely piloted, but will be, again, algorithmically piloted with AI and machine learning uh, helping this whole process. You see hints of that on this battlefield. You're starting to see swarms of drones. You're seeing suicide drones. You're seeing drones going considerable distances. You're seeing maritime drones that have hit Russian ships, not just in the ports in Crimea, but also in Russia uh, proper, going after air bases, the North, uh, the uh, Black Sea Fleet headquarters itself and so forth. So these are the signposts to the future of warfare, noting that, frankly, the Ukrainian and even the Russian systems are nowhere near as sophisticated as those that the U.S. and other Western countries and presumably other adversaries have. And I noted in your book, Elon Musk's Starlink satellite system allowed the Ukrainian's communications when the Russians had knocked it out. We have uh, Palantir being part of the, uh, I guess, in intelligence. Big data and analytics and all the rest of that. Because again, the key here is not collecting all of this data, which has expanded at exponential uh, terms and dimensions. It's the analysis of it. It's the fusion of it. It's bringing all of it together. And now it includes uh, increasing amounts of cyber, that which is on the internet, the transparency of this war, as I mentioned earlier, because of smartphones, internet access, and social media is un unequaled. It's truly unique. Is the private sector, courtesy of the technologically sort of eminent companies that we all know in the West, actually becoming more integrated with the public sector in this domain in a way that hasn't been? Undoubtedly it is. And that's been a good thing in the West because the West tends to be much more innovative than its opponents. And that's a, that's a key aspect of it, to uh, be able to harness the, the drive and the genius of, um, of capitalism, essentially, uh, has been something that's been invaluable. Of course, there, there are occasional hiccups. Um, the classic one, of course, being Mr. Musk deciding not to allow the Ukrainians to use Starlink over Crimea, um, which was a uh, uh, controversial decision, needless to say. And um, it's difficult to think of that many um, historical examples of a private individual being able to affect the, um, the outcome of a military operation to that degree. Uh, so that's an aspect, of course, that needs to be factored in. But overall, we're incredibly lucky. And for those who read your book, I'm just going to, again, just extract one paragraph as everybody is trying to understand the ramifications of AI. You say fighter jets piloted by, by AI tend to beat humans in simulated dogfights, not least because they can near instantaneously identify patterns of contact and that an adversary did not plan or notice and that, then recommend methods to counteract them. Very true. And not only that, of course, uh, the machine doesn't get as crushed by G-forces, having actually been in an FNA-18 that took off in a carrier and landed on it, and actually you pull Gs until you, you literally begin to black out, uh, the machine can keep on functioning, of course. The machine doesn't get tired. It might run out of batteries or something like that. But again, the, the advent of these machines is 
going to absolutely transform the battlefield. And the dilemma is that we, for ethical reasons, want to keep a human in the loop always. I think the reality is going to be that the human in the loop will be the individual who programs it, who develops the algorithm, who establishes the conditions that the machine meets uh, through a variety of means, whether it's facial recognition, gait recognition, voice recognition, other imagery uh, recognition, or what have you. And the machine is going to have to make the final decision on those conditions. You might actually press a button that says you may now do that. But if you hold on to the trigger uh, with a human in the loop, your machine probably will be slower than the other machine and your machine will lose. And you have that quotation which just stayed with me, which was when a robot dies, you don't have to write a letter to its mother. Equally, um, it, when a robot's in charge, it shows no pity, no remorse, no mercy. Uh, when it's factored into its uh, algorithms to win, that's what it's going to do. And uh, so that's another aspect of war that will be different. Having written so many letters of condolence to America's mothers and fathers and, and so forth, and the battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, you know, you, again, don't write a letter of condolence uh, to the mother and father of the machine. Uh, and yet another dynamic that changes as machines become much more ubiquitous uh, than do manned systems. And it changes again the dynamics, especially candidly for democracies that rightly, understandably, are very concerned. Uh, about human loss. It's a huge factor uh, in the ability to sustain these campaigns. Let's just recognize, for example, that we've been uh, in Korea for I don't know, 75, 80 years, whatever it is now. Um, most Americans are unaware that we have tens of thousands of soldiers there, or even more in Japan. Again, in a sense, left over from World War II, but obviously they're now for other reasons. Uh, whereas if you have a loss in a battlefield somewhere else, uh, that is obviously a very, very prominent, very significant development, uh, and it can undermine, depending on the importance of that particular mission in the eyes of uh, domestic populations, uh, that can become a very significant factor, obviously, in the ability of a country to continue a particular campaign. David's mention of Korea uh, reminds us, of course, of uh, the central issue about strategic command, because um, Douglas MacArthur, for all his many uh, attributes, did not show that in uh, in Korea, whereas Matthew Ridgway did. And uh, the results of the war very much alter between one and the other. Yeah, MacArthur, colossal miscalculation, uh, believed that China would not come into the war, uh, even if we went all the way to the all. Obviously, they did. It changed the character of that war dramatically, uh, pushed all the way back down almost off the peninsula. Uh, MacArthur ultimately fired for insubordination. Ridgway comes in and steadies the force, provides the the right big ideas, and essentially gets us back to the 38th parallel uh, in, in a very inspirational manner. Uh, in addition to getting strategic leadership right in terms of the big ideas, he also pro provided an extraordinary example and energy and, and drive and so forth, and uh, really a very admirable figure. One of the very few in history, by the way, who was successful on the battlefield, uh, various battlefields of World War II as the commander of the 82nd Airborne Division in particular, uh, and then succeeded as a strategic commander, as the, an actual campaign, uh, the commander of an actual theater of war. And again, there are very few throughout history who have demonstrated the ability to do both. So the, the peace dividend that we all celebrated seems like yesterday is well behind us. And you write a recurring theme of this book is that money spent on deterrence is seldom wasted, especially when considered against the costs incurred when deterrence fails. As an investor, what comes out is we're in a secular uptrend for the armaments industry and various components of it. Um, where, is, where do you think more of the money will be spent? Well, I hope that it is spent transforming our forces, as I have described as necessary, again, from small number of large platforms to a massive number of small, unmanned, increasingly algorithmically uh, run platforms. 
that's what we should do. But of course, there are many forces that will compel us to continue to invest in what are termed legacy systems. And they have a huge value. I loved having two aircraft carrier task forces uh, in the greater Middle East when I was the commander of U.S. Central Command. Uh, but that's not necessarily what you may want to have in some future combat uh, where you can see everything, hit everything, and, and kill everything. And it's very difficult to defend some of these systems, although certainly not impossible. But we do see this secular trend. We do see Germany. For, you know, the, so you see the number two economy in the world, Japan, is dramatically increasing uh, its defense spending over a period of about five years. You see continued very high uh, U.S. defense spending. It will continue to go up. Many of us would love to see it go up even more. Uh, but again, that will be very substantial. And then you see the number four economy in the world, Germany, uh, going from below 1.5% to a commitment at the very least of 2% of GDP on defense. And then many other countries uh, in Europe, but also in the Middle East and in Asia, uh, responding to the actions of Russia, responding to threats elsewhere uh, in the world. It, the interesting dynamic right now is that I would contend that the U.S. and its Western allies and partners are keeping more plates spinning around the world than at any time at least since the end of the Cold War, if not the end of World War II. You don't just have, again, what Russia is doing. You still have North Korea. Obviously, you have China, which is the biggest of the plates. It's an overall relationship that is what matters there. Uh, you still got Islamist extremist groups in various locations. You have Iran with various different threats, maybe even different plates, if you will. There are cyber threats. There's domestic populism in various places that can undermine create challenges. So you add all of this together. And then on top of that, you add the uh, effects essentially of climate change, the extreme weather, uh, fires, storms, and so on. Uh, and you have a very, very challenging landscape. Especially with China, China's increased its defense spending by 16% over the last two years. They're building aircraft carriers, which have no um, strategic sense um, if they're defensive. You know, you don't need aircraft carriers in, in defense. And so um, it is obviously an offensive um, capability that they're attempting to build up. Um, they want to expel the um, uh, United States from Southeast Asia. The United States is not going to allow that to happen. So clearly, defense spending is going to go up uh, all around the world. We've got a we've got an actual war in Europe, um, and so uh, I think uh, being in defense industry at the moment is a pretty uh, safe bet. Now, as you look forward in the book towards the end, obviously Taiwan is is front and center stage as a discussion for, for everybody. What are the implications of this Russo-Ukraine war for China-Taiwan? Well, one hopes that this is a cautionary tale uh, for China. Uh, one hopes that every single morning leaders in Beijing wake up and say, not today. And of course, we have agency in this, the, the US and our Western allies and partners. Uh, if we transform our capabilities properly, we shore up the elements of deterrence, which are essentially an adversary's potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand, that's our forces and so forth, and then our willingness to employ them on the other. We have to be very conscious of what we do around the world. I think it's hugely significant that what takes place in Ukraine does echo not just in terms of the hardware and the, and the battlefield and so forth, but just the U.S. and Western determination to support a country that has been brutally invaded without provocation, a fellow democracy, however imperfect that may be. Um, and again, as we think about the, quote, opportunity cost between the Indo-Pacific and Ukraine, if you don't get Ukraine right, you undermine deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. And we should make no mistake about that. Again, the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and the way it was conducted was seized on by leaders in Beijing. President Xi said, see, can't count on the Americans and look at how that went. They're a great power in decline. So we have to be very conscious of what we do in other places in the world. Uh, if you declare a red line and then it's not a red line, that reverberates. I remember being in Southeast Asia, in fact, when that happened uh, in Syria and the prime minister of a very important uh, U.S. partner uh, said, you know, that stuff reverberates out here. And he's exactly right. But Andrew, you made the important point earlier on that in the 
the world of Russia and the US, there was no economic impact because Russia was immaterial, but China, of course, is very different. How, if pushed, how might you think this evolves. I hope that President Xi recognises that there are many more US interests at play in Taiwan than there were in Ukraine. Um, the semiconductor industry of uh, Taiwan is in and of itself so important that uh, the Americans can't really allow that to um, uh, an invasion of um, Taiwan to uh, stand. And so it's a, um, a much more uh, nuanced decision for Xi than it seems to have been for uh, Putin. I've asked you the easy questions. Your peers have asked some questions. So I'm going to just toss a few of these in. Peter Frankopan, who you both know, author of The Silk Roads, says, does more automation make the chance of conflict greater? I'm looking at you, David. Yeah, it's a tough question, actually. Again, as we've mentioned earlier, the fact that it's machines that might be dying rather than humans, uh, you know, that that's a bit easier to accept. Nonetheless, the damage that can be wrought by machines, even without humans, is still so substantial uh, that I think you have to weigh the balance here. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I have a definitive answer one way or the other. I think what we have to be keenly aware of is that actions by machines, and by the way, these are machines not just in the air or on the ground or in the surface uh, of the sea, but these are subsea, they're in space, they're in cyberspace, essentially. I mean, if you will, cyber capabilities, and there's a war going on there almost every day, but they have uh, enormous potential as well. And we have to be very careful uh, not to underestimate the results of actions in any one of these domains, nor to underestimate the reality that if there is significant conflict, it will be in all of these domains simultaneously. Peter's got a, a very good question here. The, the advance in the machine must increase the likelihood of an accidental um, yeah. war breaking out. So Neil Ferguson asks, how and when does the war in Ukraine end? When both sides want it to, or at least one side wants it to, and at the moment neither side um, thinks that it's going to lose, and so it's not going to end anytime soon, I think. If I could hear, I think what this really implies, though, for us is that we need to continue to do everything that we possibly can to enable Ukraine to convince Vladimir Putin that this war is unsustainable that on the battlefield, and then together all Western nations need to do the same when it comes to tightening the sanctions, the financial, economic, and personal sanctions and export controls, and the enforcement of those so that sanctions evasion is clamped on, down on as well. And then General Nick Carter, who's also, along with the others, been guest on the show, said, has the West lost almost all the wars it's fought since '45 because the political objectives never match the military objectives? I don't think it has lost all the uh, <laughs> wars since 1945 at all. Uh, Nick, um, who has read this book, actually, uh, has taken away slightly different uh, uh, takeaway than uh, I think than it's really I have. a provocative question, actually. <laughs> you, can say, you can say that again. <laughs> and by the way, he was a superb battlefield commander. I think I believe it's accurate that he commanded more American forces when he was a two-star general in Kandahar. He had Kandahar and Helmand uh, than any... British general, at least since World War II, and arguably maybe even uh, including that. Uh, and then, of course, was a magnificent deputy commander uh, in Afghanistan before being the chief of the general staff and eventually the chief of defense, of defense staff. But I think he does present something that is eating a bit at Western military leaders, which is, is there the capacity, is there the will uh, to carry out tough campaigns. Um, and ultimately, of course, uh, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, that was not there, even though, again, there had been the cost in blood had been very little over the final 18 months of that. Uh, and the cost in treasure was quite sustainable as well. You can argue that there was a sustainable commitment that could have been sustained. Um, and yet we chose to withdraw. 
And wasn't that true of um, Vietnam as well by 1973? Uh, once wasn't there a way in which the South Vietnamese could continue with American uh, support, but not massive American number of American boots on the ground? Certainly, it's arguable that it could have been uh, that the air power might have, as it did a couple of years earlier, tipped the balance uh, in favor of the South, but the U.S. will to continue that just that support much less boots on the ground, had evaporated. And Simon Seabag Montefiore's question was, who was the greatest general of the 20th century? General, general Jap, Marshal Zhukov, Moshe Dayan, Marshal Limbao, and why? Well, actually, funny enough, um, I'm glad that Simon mentioned um, Jap, because, of course, Jap did uh, win against the French in Indochina. And, and the Americans. He was the great strategic leader of Indochine and then of the Vietnam War. Exactly. I'd, I'd give him a, a big tick, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. But then what about some World War II figures uh, as well? I think you have to look at some of the great leaders of that time. Yeah, uh, Seabag um, really should have concentrated on the same period as our book, from <laughs> 1945 <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to Ukraine. Now... As I move to a conclusion, George Soros, the great investment manager, hedge fund manager, sort of kind of always taught us, you know, discount the obvious and expect the unexpected. And you have actually written in this book, the Falklands reminded the West that conflicts can emerge suddenly from out of what seems like a clear blue sky, as this book has shown surprise attacks are surprisingly common. Where's the surprise? I'm quite surprised by what's happening in Kosovo. Um, at the moment. It, I, I thought that that was pretty much uh, dealt with, over and done with, but uh, it seems that there are lots of indications that that might uh, flare up again, which would be, of course, absolutely tragic. There's still possibilities in the Middle East. Um, Iran is carrying out a number of threatening out activities throughout the greater Middle East, in fact. Um, and then, obviously, the potentials in the Indo-Pacific, which I think we all recognize very clearly but and believe that it would be very, very unwise uh, for conflict to break out, but it's something that cannot be discounted. And I, I think the one of the big revelations of Ukraine, among many that we've already discussed, is also the fact that our military industrial bases are just inadequate, uh, the sheer consumption of munitions in Ukraine has been staggering. Uh, and there's a very broad recognition in the US and Europe that we have to dramatically ramp up our production of munitions in case this kind of war is repeated elsewhere. So I've taken up a lot of your time. It's been absolutely terrific. Uh, we haven't discussed the other parts of the book properly, Korea into China, Malaya, Iran versus Iraq, Somalia, the Balkans, war is everywhere and forever. So um, we will be putting all the links on the show notes um, to conflict. Um, this is a seminal work, gentlemen. I think it will uh, it will reverberate for, for a very long time. And I've taken two specific things from listening to you today. And one is that Technology is at the epicenter of so much of tomorrow's warfare with implications that most of us haven't even been able to process, but that at a human level, strategy is paramount. If you don't get that right, then good luck. Got to get the big ideas right in business as well as in conflict. Andrew, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon. Great to be with you again, Simon. <laughs> 